All right, well, welcome everyone to um, Viridian at County Farm, Accelerating the Transformation to a World of Living Communities, Intro to the Living Community Challenge. This course is approved for one hour in continuing education units, um, GBCI, AIBD, BPI, to name a few, as well as the AIA Health, Welfare, and Safety, which may make it applicable to your state-based design or contractor license. Uh, today, I will be your moderator. My, my name is Brett Little, and I'm the executive director here at the uh, nonprofit, the Green Home Institute. Um, today, we're going to learn about a community design in the neighborhood level that incorporates the health, safety, and welfare of its members in the development from the beginning stage, and how you can play a role in that, too, um, if you'd like. And before we get started, I wanted to say a big thanks to our sponsor, uh, Mitsubishi, uh, very excited to see that they won the 2019 Green Innovation of the Year for their zoning efficiency. Um, you can check them out for all your heating, cooling, and ventilation needs. Uh, today's low load homes require right sized equipment that most systems, especially gas fired, cannot meet. Mitsubishi has a low load, high efficient heat pump that dehumidifies and um, cools in the summer and then works in reverse to heat in the winter. Going ductless reduces costs and makes it easier to meet Energy Star version 3 lead for home certification. Ductless mini splits can now be hidden in many different ways to meet your client's needs. And ducted systems can also be used as well. The ducted systems are hidden behind the walls to ensure a beautiful space and can be retrofitted in place of a furnace in an existing single family or multi-family project. Hyperheat ensures efficient heat delivery down to a negative 13 degrees and backup strip heaters can kick in during those very rare uh, but cold days. Each room can be customized to the temp you'd like it. Same goes for multifamily and commercial buildings using centralized variable refrigerant flow or VRF systems uh, when serving whole buildings. These can also be customized to simultaneously heat some rooms, cool others, and ventilate uh, as well. Check out Mitsubishi Comfort today for all your HVAC needs. Thanks to our secondary sponsor as well, uh, Niagara Conservation, uh, 0.8 gallon per flush, uh, uh, single flush toilet um, uh, is a, a stealth, works uh, number one using half the amount of water out there. And you can also check out um, some of their other devices, uh, 0.5 uh, aerators, 1.25 shower heads, all water sense certified. Check them out over at uh, Niagara.com. All right, so with that, I'm excited to introduce our speaker. Uh, Matt is the founding principal of Thrive Collaborative, working to create uh, life-enhancing buildings that harvest their own energy and water, create zero waste, and are beautiful and restorative. He is a developer and currently creating a Viridium at County Farm, a net zero energy mixed income neighborhood targeting living community challenge certification, and uh, has been honored in United Nations Sustainable Development Goals in their local project gallery. He was honored as a 2012 Michigan Green Leader by the Detroit Free Press, called a proven zero energy master by the Green Building Elements, and one of the greater Detroit most progressive personalities by Ford uh, Magazine. He's a nationally renowned advocate and thought leader on net zero buildings, living buildings, and restorative design. Matt is a sought after speaker, writer, and frequent source for journalists. Until he um, reduced his air travel, he spoke in many countries around the world, including Brazil, Italy, Croatia, and more. And I'm just thrilled that Matt, you know, spent some of his time here to join us today. I really appreciate your time, and um, real excited to have helped highlight and feature his uh, zero energy capable certified house there too, over in Ann Arbor. So Matt, um, with that, I am going to hand it over to you here, and uh, please take it away. All right. Hey, guys, everybody, thank you so much for being on. I know, whoop, wait, there we go. Uh, uh, Brett, can everybody see my screen? Because uh, something different popped up just now. Yeah, once you click share, we'll be good to go. Yep. All right. It's all right. All right. And how's that? Everybody good? Perfect. All right. So again, thanks everybody. I really appreciate it. Uh, uh, webinars are sometimes not as uh, not not as engaging as in person, but the advantage is that uh, pants are always optional. So for you pantsless folks out there, I appreciate you spending the time. Um, and thanks for not turning on your uh, camera. 
Uh, and also just a quick uh, little public service announcement, wash your hands this year. I've uh, been sick, sick with the flu 10 days and then about 11 days in recovery right now, still not fully recovered. The good news is that I've actually finished Netflix, um, but I, I won't tell you how it ends if, uh, if you guys haven't done that yet. Um, but uh, that said, so let's go ahead and we'll get started today. Really what I'm gonna talk about is uh, mostly about Viridian at County Farm, our current Living Community Challenge Project. And hopefully it's gonna be very inspiring for you. What we're really wanting to talk about is, is a future that doesn't suck. A lot of the narrative right now in the green building industry, in climate crisis, and every headline that we read about politics is about what's wrong. Um, there are very few people presenting the examples of that inspiring future. What will an all electric future that is powered with renewable energy and a network of microgrids look like? Um, and what will people's lives be like on an individual basis? And that's really what Viridian County Farm is trying to, to uh, prove. And typically, I, I, I'm known for being uh, very, very, very positive. But um, and I start all my talks off with being positive. But since last March, I've stopped doing that. So we're we're going to start with this, right? Everybody knows what this is by now. Uh, about a year and a half ago, the United Nations uh, looked at our Paris targets and said we've got very little chance of meeting them. We basically have until the end of this year to really start catalyzing the change that we need by 2030. As it stands right now, our existing infrastructure is going to blow us past this 1.5 degree target. Uh, much higher than that, and the results can be pretty damn catastrophic, right? This is what we're looking at now, and we're accelerating at such an extraordinary rate, uh, and we're going in the opposite direction. We are not decarbonizing. So I, I really want to make the case today that all new construction must be all electric. Uh, that alone can reduce our total energy consumption by about 40%, uh, up to 60% in some, uh, in some places. Uh, so electrification alone is a precondition to decarbonization. And it's something we can do in our individual homes. And we certainly must do in uh, in new development. Um, uh, so rather than starting with my typical you know, inspirational beginnings, I'm going to start my talk with the end of this young woman, Greta Thunberg's talk. Uh, this was from October of 2018 now, uh, when she was just 15 years old. Um, and this is the end of her TED talk that kind of launched her into global recognition. Now we're almost at the end of my talk. And this is where people usually, people usually start talking about hope, solar panels, wind power, circular economy, and so on. But I'm not going to do that. We've had 30 years of pep talking and selling positive ideas. And I'm sorry, but it doesn't work. Because if it would have, the emissions would have gone down by now. They haven't. And yes, we do need hope. Of course we do. But the one thing we need more than hope is action. Once we start to act, hope is everywhere. So instead of looking for hope, look for action. Then, and only then, hope will come. So. I had the wonderful privilege of meeting with Greta Thunberg uh, 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 early last year in uh, March of uh, 2019. And what I learned from her and a lot of the other students is that hope is something that you earn. Uh, we've got to take action. And uh, every the, the takeaway today needs to be, let's just do this. All eyes forward. Don't engage with trolls. Uh, don't spend all your time looking backwards. Certainly, we do need to look 20% back and uh, figure out how do we uh, close some of these pipelines. But at the end of the day, those pipelines all in, end inside of our homes. So we need to address those things first. Um, and action is the only way that we're going to get there. And I'll make a pitch to you guys uh, at the end of this uh, to talk about how you guys can actually invest in Viridian at County Farm. Uh, through a crowdfunding platform that we're doing to try to open this up and rethink how we're funding some of these net zero energy communities. 
this is the picture that um, I used to start my talks with because I've always found it incredibly inspiring. It is the, uh, it's an image taken from the Cassini spacecraft in 2013. And what's gorgeous about this image is not just that the high resolution of the rings of Saturn, but if you look really closely at some of these objects in the background, right there you can see Ann Arbor, Michigan, where I'm speaking from today. And if you can look a little bit closer, there's the Green Home Institute over there in Grand Rapids, where uh, Jessica and, and uh, Brett are. Um, everything that has happened uh, in, in human history has happened on that pale blue dot. Every act of kindness, every act of love, uh, every act of hatred, and every act of war has all happened on that pale blue dot. We've got strong evidence there is life elsewhere, but as far as we know, that's it. This is what we've got to work with. And so last uh, February, I took my daughters uh, out of school early so that they could watch the Falcon Heavy spacecraft take off when Elon Musk was launching his Tesla into outer space. And when the camera turned back on planet Earth and the star man in the background, my four-year-old daughter at the time, for the very first time, got to see a live image of planet Earth, of the whole Earth. And it was unbelievable to watch her excitement, to look back at planet Earth and, and scream out loud, hey, that's where we live. And, and I said to her, yeah, that's right. I said, that's where we all live. And she looked up at me with these beautiful little brown eyes with such innocence. She says, yes, we share it. And a little four-year-old girl had this recognition, this utter beauty. And before you go thinking that you know, I'm this great dad for taking my parents out, I, uh, my, my children out of school, um, I do have to share this one parenting moment um, that I did a couple of weeks later, where you, you know this moment if you've got kids, where you're trying to get them upstairs to bed, go brush your teeth, go wash your face, get in your jammies, and no, 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 five more minutes, five more minutes, five more minutes. And I said, listen, I'm not going to argue with you guys. So from my phone, I was able to turn off the downstairs lights, walk up the stairs, and turn on some music. And I said, you guys can stay down here as long as you'd like. I'll just be upstairs waiting for you. And then the screams came, the blood-curdling screams from my innocent sweet girls. <laughs> and they were chasing me up the stairs. And uh, it, it, it worked. Um, I, I don't recommend this. It's not the greatest parenting tool. But uh, it did get them upstairs. Um, <coughs> And this was a bittersweet moment about uh, uh, just before Christmas, my older daughter in fifth grade, she, uh, her teacher asked all the class, if you could be a superhero, what superpower would you like to have? And this is what my little daughter, this is the world she's living in. And the superpower to snap my fingers and climate change would disappear. And why? Because it's hard to do yourself. And this is the world that we're gifting to our children, this world where they have to think about their superhero powers being about climate change. And this is the conventional development model that we're dealing with. It is deeply and inherently flawed in every way. It degrades our ecosystems. We, we allow developers to externalize their cost and make the community pay the price for their negative actions uh, for polluting our waterways and our air. Uh, for degrading our social systems and decreasing mental health, um, for, for putting you know, the climate impacts, uh, for degrading local ecosystems and destroying habitats with our car-based culture. Uh, this is actually a picture of a parking lot right here in Ann Arbor, but this could be anywhere. It could be Grand Rapids, it could be Everett, Washington. Um, the image and the development model is repeated nationwide. Uh, and this is what happens when we design things from Google satellite maps uh, instead of from Google Street View. So this was uh, an image that I put together just prior to a talk that I gave in Verona, Italy. And I was, as I was walking through the streets of Verona, I was struck by the organic nature of the streets and how beautiful it was. And when I would look at the maps, I realized, wow, look at just how organic this feels. And just for the dog, I had this thought that it looks very much like a leaf. So I pulled up this x-ray image of, of a leaf and placed it side by side with this map of Verona. And during my talk, I looked at it and realized that it's actually not Verona, it's Venice, but the point is the same. And the longer you stare at this image, the more fascinating it becomes. And you question, why does an image of a human-built environment 
mimic so perfectly this organic bottom-up image of, of a leaf structure that's self-assembled. And the, the reason is uh, because it has to. Before you have Google satellite maps, before you have Caterpillar tractors and the ability to ship products uh, from around the globe um, and materials, and you have the ability to regrade the landscaping and let the and control where the water flows, you have to work with the natural conditions that you're given. And so what happens is, is this very adjacent, um, a very complex system that evolves based on simple rules for local interaction in the same way that it does for a for for ants or termites or for the biology of a of of, of a leaf um, all of these structures are bottom up and iterative and organic and so the question is how do we design communities and buildings that are ecologically restorative socially just and culturally rich so i'm going to take a step back for just a minute and go back to 2006 when my wife and i were running past this house and we looked at this house with the south facing roof and we we're like wow that is our dream house right it's got a plywood front porch asbestos siding an aluminum front door i had zero insulation uh, at all anywhere in the house except for a layer of newspaper in the attic uh, dated 1901. um <laughs> And I, I just noticed the little racist image there on the lower left corner. I'm not sure exactly what that is, but it's the first time I've noticed that. Um, uh, but uh, also just lead paint throughout the entire house. We had uh, single pane windows, the original uh, uh, single pane glass uh, that, uh, but the, all of the windows were painted shut and yet there you could stick a spatula in the gap there and you could see the broken, um, uh, uh, seals in the windows uh, with the air leakage. We had uh, carpeting covering all of the heart pine floors from wood that was growing at the time that Columbus sailed for America. Um, we had refrigerator from 1988 that you could hear humming all over the house. We had uh, toilets that flushed five gallons per flush. We had genuine formica in the bathroom, but there's no shower. So, uh, uh, you had uh, faucets that were running at several gallons per minute. We had a Mueller Climatrol furnace that replaced a coal furnace that had replaced uh, wood burning and coal burning pot belly stoves that, threw, uh, that threw, were throughout the house. Um, and to this day, we still find uh, chunks of coal uh, uh, from the coal piles that were originally in the backyard. That Mueller Climatrol furnace uh, cost us about $350 a month to run in the winter time and for that privilege we got to uh, sleep in uh, uh, full sweatpants and socks and a buckwheat pillow heated and pushed to the bottom of our comforter to stay warm on on the winter nights um, this was the house in 1913 when gertrude gauss's um, uh, oldest brother uh, had uh, was two years old uh, that's gertrude gauss's parents elizabeth and philip gauss we purchased the house from Gertrude, who was born in the house in 1921. Um, we purchased it from her in 2006. Um, uh, this was the house uh, just after we bought it. Uh, we started removing the asbestos tiles, again, our dream house. And we set this goal of making it 100% uh, renewable energy, um, harvesting all of its energy, harvesting its own water, and, um, and eliminating its waste and making it a restorative part of the community. And we uh, did this all within historic preservation standards. And in uh, uh, 2014, we were awarded with Living Building Challenge Net Zero Energy uh, certification, uh, meaning that we harvest all the energy that we need on site over the course of the year with no combustion whatsoever. And on uh, the second day of spring of 2014, um, we brought our newborn daughter Dahlia home from the hospital and uh, she's there she is still in her car seat and I was opening up the mail and there was a check from the utility company for for five hundred dollars for our renewable energy credits from the prior year and at that moment I realized as I was bringing this newborn daughter into our home that net zero energy and with no gas whatsoever was her new normal um, not just her new normal, it was her only normal. It was all she was ever going to know. So she's among the first of a generation of what my 
mother-in-law calls the net zero babies. And, uh, and it was a wonderfully inspiring moment. And because of our house, we got attention around the world and literally over 150 publications from around the world, and media outlets. Um, there's my daughter reading Solar Today on her little potty. Uh, it's just recently on uh, Good Morning Croatia. Uh, it's, it's an actual show, most popular show in Croatia, talking about decarbonization in the, e in the EU and, um, and net zero energy in Croatia. And one of my favorite accolades was uh, Green Building Elements called me the, 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 zero, the proven zero energy master. USA Today called it one of the best green homes in America. And uh, The Atlantic called it sustainable perfection. And while that sounds beautiful, it's all kind of BS. Um, there is no such thing as a sustainable building. There's really no such thing as a sustainable anything. All of life is interconnected. It's based on underlying networks of things that work symbiotically. Um, there's no waste uh, in nature. Um, and so we have to ask this question, what use is a fine house if you haven't got a tolerable planet to put it on? And how do we create those conditions inside of our buildings and then extrapolate that to the community level? How do we create the conditions that are conducive to life not just human life, but to all of life that are mutually beneficial. So it's time that we start to imagine this living future and a world of living communities. Thanks for watching. Please continue to watch the next part of the session to complete the course and get your continuing education credits. Be sure to check out all of our courses available online that you can watch anytime and anywhere to pick up your CEUs. Before you go, make sure to subscribe to us on YouTube to get weekly updates and stay up to date on green building science courses, webinars, and home tours. Thanks again.